the middle of that cycle, the three-year cycle. But the revised common lectionary is the text, the, the, the text that we pick each Sunday uh, or that are in your bulletin each Sunday are guided, we are guided because of your B to those texts each year. I'll get it out yet. I'm holding my words this morning. But at any rate. So happy new year. Uh, our first Sunday of Advent in year B. Please rise for our confession. Blessed be the Holy us wisdom to welcome your light and to seek the things that will endure until Christ comes again in glory. Amen. Comfort, O oh comfort, my people, says your God. In Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven and all things are made new. Rejoice in this good news. Amen. Amen.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Please be seated as we light the Advent wreath. At every beginning, there is a yearning for the one who is coming. O Emmanuel, wake us up to your coming. We gather together to expect the unexpected and to imagine the unimaginable. O Emmanuel, wake us up to your coming. We wait for the day when God will recycle tanks into tractors and transform minefields into soccer fields. O Emmanuel, Wake, Wake us up. up we stay awake by telling stories that offer a glimmer of a future and agitate dormant hope within us. O oh, Emmanuel, wake, wake us up, up to your coming. coming. Jesus, we welcome your presence now with the lighting of this candle, whose flames bring warmth to winter and fills this place with the glow of hope. Let us pray. We praise you, O oh God for this evergreen crown that marks our days of preparation for Christ's advent. As we light the first candle on this wreath, rouse us from sleep, that we may be ready to greet our Lord when he comes with all the saints and angels. Enlighten us with your grace and prepare our hearts to welcome him with joy. Grant this through Christ our Lord, whose coming is certain and whose day draws near. Amen. Let us pray. Stir up your power, Lord Christ, and come. By your merciful protection, awaken us to the threatening dangers of our sins and keep us blameless until the coming of your new day. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Our first reading is from Isaiah, the 64th chapter. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you, who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways. But you were angry and we sinned. Because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Yet, O Lord, you are our Father, We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider we are all your people. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We will read the psalm by a whole verse. The congregation will read the dark print. 
Hear, O shepherd of Israel, leading Joseph like a flock, shine forth, you that are enthroned upon the cherubim, in the presence of Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh, stir up your strength and come to help us. Restore us, O God, let your face shine upon you and us, and we shall be saved. O Lord, God of hosts, how long will your anger fume when your people pray? You have fed them with the bread of tears. You have given them bowls of tears to drink. You have made us the derision of our neighbors, and our enemies laugh us to scorn. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine upon us, and we shall be saved. Let your hand be upon the one at your right hand, the one you have made so strong for yourself. And so will we never turn away from you. Give us life that we may call upon your name. Restore us, O Lord, God of hosts. Let your face shine upon us, and we shall be saved. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end, so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The word of the Lord. The gospel reading comes from the 13th chapter of St. Mark. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, In those days after that suffering, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge. Each with his work and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Christ. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Been away for the last couple of weeks. I haven't been here. It's nice to be back. This is a, a beautiful sanctuary. It's a 
really well done. I was in Spain uh, when I was away. And uh, one of the things you do in Spain is you'll, you, you go to visit churches. And in Madrid, I visited one of the largest cathedrals in the world. Absolutely massive. You wouldn't believe the size of this thing and the things they had in it. They had a, a silver, an altar that was done completely in silver. They had another one that was done completely in gold. Had all these carvings all over it. Took them years and years to build. And in Barcelona, I visited what they call the Sagrada Familia. It has spires that'll be 500 feet tall. Just amazing stained glass. Beautiful, beautiful buildings. But because they're so big, because they've taken so long to build, because they've done so much with them, does that make the message delivered in those churches any better than the message that's delivered here? No, it's not the building that makes the church. It's not the stained glass windows, it's not the carvings, it's not how high or how big you can build it. It's the message that's delivered inside. The people who are there, how they care for those who are in the congregation and how they care for those in the community, how they love God, how they worship, how they come together in bad times. So the size of the building, the fanciness of the building doesn't make a difference. It's the message and how we love God. So let's have a brief prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to worship and love you no matter where, no matter when. No matter whether it's a magnificent church or a humble chapel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The Book of Zohar, ever hear of it? The Book of Zohar is part of the collection of books within the literature known as the Kabbalah. Kabbalistic literature focuses on mystical teachings. It includes commentary on the five books of Moses known as the Torah. And the Kabbalah includes scriptural interpretations as well as uh, material on mysticism, mythical cosmology, and mystical psychology. The Book of Zohar. It contains discussions of the nature of God and the origin and the structure of the universe. It contains information about the nature of souls and redemption and the relationship of ego to the darkness and our true selves to the light of God. That's all according to Wikipedia. Anyway, in this old Jewish book of Zohar, there goes a statement like this. Whenever the Jews on earth rejoice in their festivals, they give praise to the Lord, and they put on fine clothing and they pile their tables with good food, so the angel asks, why do the Jews pamper themselves so much? And God answers, because they have a distinguished guest today. I am with them. I'm saying that on this first Sunday of Advent, we are like the Jewish community. On this first Sunday of the new church year, we begin our preparations to have a very distinguished guest among us. In this Advent season, a season that we mark as preparation, we will be reminded that God is with us. We will sing all those ancient, magnificent Advent and Christmas hymns over the next few weeks. One of the most popular being, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And together, collectively, in these four weeks, we won't rush it, we will together watch and wait. Have you noticed, though, in the midst of every time God seeks to make a change in the world, God allows a baby to be born? First, it was an infant in the bulrushes in Egypt. 
and then a child in the manger in Bethlehem. God always comes to us in most unexpected manners. Now, we know, uh, what we know about God is that God discloses and reveals who God is. We have a hidden and a revealed God, our theology says. So in the biblical narrative, usually God appears in a quiet, low-key, almost unseen manner. The subtleness of divine revelation is indeed very fascinating. And it challenges our preconceptions and, our, and it highlights the mysterious ways in which God interacts with the human experience. So therefore, it often requires us to have discerning eyes to recognize those deep, intense moments in relationship with God. But at times, it catches us by surprise and it adds some depth to the narrative, like finding hidden gems in the story because we didn't expect it to be that way. The advent of Jesus' birth, I believe, is no exception to that rule. The babe in Bethlehem always appears less than what he really is. And like a child born in obscurity and poverty, like a young man growing up and being unnoticed for years, like a prisoner refusing to answer to false accusations from a judge, and like a man riding on the back of a donkey, his coming was so common and so ordinary that the masses overlooked him. Within Advent, God really does appear to be casual and down to earth. But the good news for us today is that God is coming and we are to take heed. Whether we hear that as good news or bad news depends on a great extent to what is going on and the circumstances that you find yourself in when you hear that. It is good news for some people it is bad news for others. Good news for those who need a change in life, for things to take a new direction, let's say. It is bad news for those who want things to remain as usual. Although I must add, what is usual in these days after a pandemic? We really haven't really figured what is usual anymore. But it is good news for the oppressed, what we hear today that God is coming. It is bad news for oppressors. It is good news for those who suffer pain and it is bad news for those who inflict pain. Today's message, good or bad, is that God is coming and we are to keep awake. Now, today's text didn't appear as if it had a lot of good news in it. It had strong eschological imagery in it, stars falling and all of the sun and the moon darkened and the power shaking. It doesn't really sound like a text for the first birth of Jesus, does it? It sounds like a text more for the second coming of Christ rather than for his birth. And several commentators on this text have pointed out that this is not what you expect on this first Sunday of Advent. Do you think there was a mistake when the commentators or when the uh, scholars set these readings into place? If you think about it, this text is more appropriate for Lent than it is for Advent. We, you and I, are ready for the Annunciation. We are not ready for an apocalypse. We should be on our way to Bethlehem, not Jerusalem. We are four, way, four weeks away from Jesus' birth, and this passage, <clears throat> this passage is two days away from Jesus' death. You and I are ready to buy gifts and to prepare for the baby's birth, but the Gospel of Mark just won't let us. Mark 13, along with Luke 21 and Matthew 24 are part of what is called the little apocalypse. It is perhaps easy to say the happy hunting ground for those who are fascinated with the end of time. All three texts borrow from Daniel's imagery of desolation for their apocalyptic imagery. And Luke 21 
figures prominently in books by doomsdayers and by preachers who are more interested in the next world than they are in this one. So I ask again, why is Mark 13 used on this first Sunday in Advent? Well, the message in this text has a good word for us. It really truly does. Mark stresses, be alert, be on your guard, keep awake. If not, you will miss the whole thing. Many have, many will again. So Advent is this awesome experience of God getting into touch with human beings. So much of it seems too good to be true. And in, it is awesome in the sense that God is veiled in human flesh and in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself based on Paul's understanding in 2 Corinthians. Mind-boggling to think that Jesus Christ became in the words of the Apostle Paul the visible likeness of the invisible God. And yet this text reminds us today that Advent is upon us to get our lives in order. And if we're not very aware, if we miss it, we may miss the whole thing again. So Advent becomes this opportunity for us to regain a sense of wonder. Dag Hammarskjöld said, God does not die on the day we cease to believe him, but we die on the day our lives cease to be illuminated by the steady radiance of God's love. It is at that point that wonder leaves us. When was the last time you really got excited about anything? How long has it been since you got a lump in your throat or shivers up your spine? In so many ways, we seem to have become so dead to feeling, so void of wonder. Television, radio, sonic booms, traffic congestion, saturation advertising, media exposure to world calamities, all of it has killed off our senses, I think. We become numb to feeling. We do not even realize that wonder has disappeared from our lives, from our existence. We have lost touch with the world around us, and we live in a day of high tech and low touch. We've developed what we've called way back, now I'm dating myself on this, but I bet you all can recognize this, the CNN complex. You remember when that first came out? During the first Gulf War, people around the world were glued to CNN to their television sets because they watched the live battle scenes of the Gulf War and the attacks over Baghdad day after day, hour after hour, along with all the missile attacks in Israel. Do you remember? And as a young pastor, I also remember the O.J. Simpson murder trial. Hours upon hours in that text. And over these last decades, there have been many, many more events where we just get saturated by them. And all of this coverage has created postmodern addicts. We're addicted to the news, to the 24-hour cycle. Oh, wait, let me grab my phone. And the addiction was reinforced way back when the World Wide Weather Channel came on so that we could watch the violent storms and the disasters. You remember them too, right? We crave information in today's world simply for information's sake, without comprehending it. And it has made it possible for the computer to open up the superhighway of the internet and this whole complex world without feeling and mystery, all of it just deadening our sense of wonder. And I miss that in Advent. In Advent, there's a quiet expectancy in the air, a pause that allows us to reflect on deeper meanings, the opportunity to savor the mystery and to appreciate the beauty of anticipation. 
Advent presents us with a magical way of rekindling a sense of wonder and anticipation, as if the world is preparing for something extraordinary. And during Advent, it, the world, you and I, the church, holds its breath, but only for a moment. Advent tells us over and over again that something exciting is about to happen. And it interjects into our bloodstream not only wonder, but also that mystery and expectation. And it invites us to embrace the mystery and to rediscover joy in our lives. Howard Thurman states in his poem that Advent is a time for the singing of angels. There must be always remaining in everyone's life some place for the singing of angels, he said. Some place for that which in itself is breathlessly beautiful. Despite all the crassness of life, despite all the hardness of life, despite all the harsh discords of life, life is saved by the singing of angels. During Advent, my friends, we experience the reality of God's grace that is beyond explanation and beyond reason. That is that mystery I made reference to. And this is always true for grace. For the grace of God in Jesus Christ is not only surprising, but unexpected and amazing. And Advent reveals the beauty and the grandeur of God. Virginia Owens in her book, And the Trees Clap Their Hands, suggests that we lose the wonder of it all because along the way everything becomes merely. Things are merely stars, or merely sunsets, or merely rain, or merely flowers, or merely mountains. Their connection with God's creation is lost. So during this Advent season, Many things become just merely for people, merely Bethlehem, merely a stable, merely a birth, and there's no feeling of wonder or mystery. That is what familiarity can do for us over the years. And Owen goes, Owens goes on to say that it is this merely quality of things that leads to crime. It's, it is merely a thing, so I'll just take it. It is merely an object, so I'll just destroy it. It is merely quality of things and life that leads to war. We, lose, we shall lose merely a few thousand men and women, but it will be worth it, we say. So within the Advent narrative, nothing becomes merely. Things are not merely things, but they are part of God's grand design. Such common things now have new meaning, such as motherhood, a birth, a baby. This is not merely the world, but with the beauty and the grandeur of God's design, that God so loved that he gave his only begotten son. So what is so great about this Advent season, that the beauty and the grandeur of God well, during Advent, we walk on tiptoes with have the feeling that something great is about to happen. Listen again to the familiar story of Bethlehem. Do not allow its familiar eyes or to deaden your sense of wonder. It is a story that will be read in every part of the world throughout this season, in every dialect and in every language. It will be dramatized cantatas and in concerts and many will consider it interesting and petty, amusing and even entertaining. Some will list it along with other holiday fantasies. It has become wrapped up in so much sentimental embroidery that its stark realism is lost. Acquired halos in some ways, becoming something quite out of this world. But take a closer look, my friends. Notice the characters. They are not people with halos. They're ordinary men and women of flesh and blood. They have fears and they have frustrations. They have 
just like you and me. Mary and Joseph were not stained glass. persons of humble faith with a sincere commitment to do the will of God. The child is not an infant prodigy of Raphael's Madonna, but is a kicking baby in Mary's arms who will grow up in a world that will never really understand him. The shepherds are not idyllic figures, but rough and tough. They're unkept men of the Judean plains, and they are the migrant workers of the first century. They were huddled together for warmth on that hillside on a bleak winter's night when they were visited by the heavenly host. Jesus, who was born within a working class family, amid the poverty of the Judean hills, we find ourselves with the, unexpe the, the unexpected joy of face to face. So here, at the beginning of a new church year, on this first Sunday of Advent, there is something almost magical about the, the way Advent evokes emotions and creates a sense of anticipation with great expectations. Because it is about to happen. The good news of Advent is that a distinguished guest is arriving, that God is coming, during the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem in that first century. And we are once again reminded that most of the world was preoccupied and too busy for that first advent so that so many missed the whole thing. So on this first Sunday of Advent, will we miss the whole event as well? Will we miss that whole experience, the wonder of God's action in the world? Our text urges us to keep vigilant to watch, and, to and our hymns tell us, O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel.
Let us profess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, he descended into hell. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. With hope and with expectation, we offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all who await God. Call your church into holy fellowship as we await the restoration of all things, Lord. And compassion, especially those who serve as missionaries, who center us on your promise to come among us and to make all things new. Receive our prayer. All creation signals your presence of the cosmos, the turn of the seasons, and living things that both both rest and our commitment to care for the earth. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Let the nations tremble at your holy presence. May prevail in all corners of the earth. Restore peace to nations in conflict. Teach righteousness to and bring stability to areas facing uncertain futures. Receive our prayer. Enrich the spirits of all who feel hopeless or fearful or de despair. Those who await healing or relief. Deliver all who have any need. Merciful God, receive, receive our prayer. Be with those who keep awake at night. Night shifts, caregivers of newborns and aging adults, stargazers, those who are anxious, those who are traveling. Reveal to all that the dark can be a place filled always with your presence. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Out your angels and you've gathered your faithful people from every time and from every place. And you call them into one fellowship. The witness of those who do this. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Listen to these and all our prayers, O God of hosts. And everlasting mercy. Amen. The peace of Let us share a sign of God's peace with one another.
Savior of the nations, come. Feed us with your love that our faith and that our lives reveal your The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our It is joy that we should at all give thanks and praise to you, Almighty, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. With the promise of a Redeemer, through whom you will also make all day when he comes to judge the angels with the church on earth. We praise your name and joy. and the end, the giver of life, birth of creation. Blessed in the light. Blessed are you. Blessed are you. Blessed are you for Mary. And blessed are you for your saved flesh. And the night Lord Jesus took bread to his disciples, saying, Take and eat for the remembrance of me. He took the cup. He gave that this cup is the new covenant in my for all people for the forgiveness of sin. remembrance of me. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ. Word dwelling among us, full of grace and truth. We remember resurrection and we look with. Holy God, we long for your spirit. Come among us, bless. Awaken your people, fill us peace on earth. Come, God. praise and glory are yours, Holy One, God incarnate, power of the God now and forever. Hallowed be thy name, thy will be done. On earth, give us this day our daily our trespasses, as we against us, and lead us not deliver us from evil. For the power and the glory. For Rejoice. You come. Share in this. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Body of Christ. 
Please rise. The body and blood of our Lord. Let us. God, for whom we wait, broken bread, and in the cup, make us ready always to welcome Christ. People in the world, announce in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. May Christ shine upon you before your path. Son and Holy Spirit, bless. Please be seated. because that was a logistical set date picket and taken for the following week we may we're not going to cross any dates off okay, just go ahead and here comes problem solved. as long as Absolutely. Just show up.